Afrotech 2017, San Francisco, California. Rodney Williams, co-founder and chief commercial officer at Listener, is giving a lightning talk on the main stage. Listener is an audio technology company that transmits data like payment information or authentication information over sound waves. He talks here about the value of the black perspective and how he continues to challenge himself to remain authentic to who he is in this industry which is infested by all birds in Patagonia. Authenticity, a virtue he challenges us to also embrace. The, the other message that's really important is that even at PNG, I don't think I was myself. I started to try to play uh, their game. I wore slacks and sperries and um, sweaters and <laughs> cardigans. It's nothing wrong if that's what you do. But I don't do that, right? I'm, I'm just, you know, I got the two-step, so, hey, you know what I mean? See. I did, you know, when I, and I, when I first started the company, I would also show up in Silicon Valley, not myself. And, and something happened after a long list of people telling me they weren't gonna give me money out of the city. I started to embrace who I was. I started to remember everything that I always, that I've been through. There's something that I learned with one of my investors and it was while we were talking about Batman. And if you all watch Batman and you remember Bane, Bane is, has this mask on and he's beating up Batman. And Bane, uh, uh, Batman goes, we're from the same place. And Bane says, no, I was born in it. You adopted it. That's us. Like, it's not a, a shield of disgrace. It's not something that we should be nervous about. Like, we should walk in the room and eat your face. Like, and that's how we should all act. So anyway, bracing yourself, embracing who you are, and being confident in that is extremely important. I'm Will Lucas, and this is Black Tech, Green Money. I'm gonna introduce you to some of the biggest names, some of the brightest minds, and brilliant ideas. If you're black in building or simply using tech to secure your bag, this podcast is for you. The lifestyle specialist, Kenny Burns, is a 20 plus year music and entertainment industry influencer and executive. He was senior vice president of brand development at Combs Enterprises, the entrepreneurial arm for Sean P. Diddy Combs and launched Revolt TV while managing the Ciroc and Deleon Tequila brands for Combs as well. I asked Kenny about authenticity and a statement he made that he's come to be known for. Get paid to be yourself. When I first made the statement, um, you know, I think in traditional business across the board, you're expected to be a certain way. Um, whether you go to Wall Street or you go to the entertainment business. And for me, you know, there's just certain things integral things that I'm just not willing to do to, to, to gain in life. Right. Like I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm firm in who I am. I'm firm in the, in who I want to grow to be. I mean, we all have layers to peel off as we ascend, but I think, you know, when I made that statement, it rang true for so many people, man, because you get put in these, these boxes and you get put in these circumstantial moments when you, apply for jobs or attain jobs and or you think you have to be a certain way going into this particular profession and i just think that you can be you and if you are yourself long enough authentically yourself um and show people you you know obviously you have to show people during that that uh that time that you know you have a specific skill set and you can do the things you say you can do it's not like you can just be an asshole and expect to win in life um, but if you are authentically yourself, you have a unique skill set, you know, you can create your own blueprint. You don't have to follow others. In tech, um, we've idolized fairly or unfairly, uh, the stereotypical Ivy league school dropout, the hoodie, you know, where, um, and it wasn't until I met, uh, Paul judge, uh, about seven years ago that I realized you didn't have to wear a hoodie in tech to be successful. Right. Right. Um, Paul was that representation for me. And likewise, you on the branding side, the marketing side is talk to me about what you see our perspective as black people that value that that has in an industry like technology. I just think presentation is everything. I think, you know, you, you show up how you want to be received. Um, 
you know, uh, before I always tell the analogy, people used to judge me so much by my pictures, right? Like you'd see this guy, he's, you know, couch surfing, he's with, you know, celebrities, he's flying private, he's just then the third, but you don't know the human, right? Like you don't know that my same friends have been my friends since the sandbox. You don't know that I've been married 21 years since October coming. Um, you don't know that I have thousands of mentees. You don't know. And, and I think, you know, that can be tricky. You can be judged basically on the way you look, you know, the way you, but I, I believe if you, you know, show up in business ready to handle your business, looking, smelling, feeling like money, nine times out of 10, you're going to get what you came for. So I don't, I don't get into, you know, and I know in tech, like, you know, it's that whole, wear flip, you know, thong flip flops and yeah, you have these yeah. creative ideas and you can do whatever. I mean, that's cool. And that's some people's thing. My thing is I want to show up, um, you know, dress ready to impress. And that's just the way I was, you know, I was brought up and, and not impressing like we need validation, but this is what I love. I love to, to dress and I love, you know, to show up smelling amazing and people be like, wait, what's that? Right. Right. Oh, you know, so. Yeah. Um, we use this word culture fit a lot. It's this tech buzzword for people who, for finding people who talk like we talk, you know, are interested in a lot, a lot of the same things. And um, as we make progress, uh, black people in tech and in business, you know, climbing the, these ladders inside corporations, starting companies and uh, looking for funding, largely for people who don't look like us. Um, how do we hold on to that truth in those instances? Because again, I see people like when I, when I met Paul, it was at like a tech crunch event and everybody's in there. It's got a t-shirt or a hoodie on it. He's getting his, you know, a Hugo boss suit or whatever he was wearing at the time. Right. Um, but how do we hold on when that value may not always be appreciated when we're trying, when we need something from the other folks? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of, um, I think that you have to have an offering. You know, I think if your offering is um, special enough, they have no choice. And I, you know, I've, I, I came into a business that I honestly didn't like after getting into it, but I was so good at connecting pieces and putting pieces together. And then when I had, you know, became I, I came to my wits end. I was like, it's over. I don't want to be in the music business anymore. I pivoted not far from what I loved about the creative process or putting things together. I just tapped more into my marketing skill set. And then, you know, obviously fashion was a part of my, my offering. So I became the second black designer ever in Saks Fifth Avenue. These were all organic and authentic steps. It wasn't like I had to step outside of myself to, you know, to, to continue the journey. And I think when you do that, that's when you lose people. If you are, you know, you, I'm, I'm sure you've met people in the tech world that has had this one idea and they won't let go of this one idea until it pops. Now, I don't suggest people do that in life, but you know, when you see that person, you're going to hear that pitch. It's going to be a little adapting and adjusting that's happened since the last, but, you know, but, but you can respect that. And I think that ultimately, you know, respect is earned. And, and a lot of times, you know, you get overlooked for being black, for being less talented, for whatever the case may be. Um, those are two extremes, not equally yoked in that particular uh, offering. But, you know, I just think that people, if you're good, you're good. They're going to see it. And if they don't, that's their loss. But, the, you know, to stop because someone else doesn't see you um, is a detriment to your your, your possibilities. Yeah. I got familiar with you. Um, I was back in the day on the radio and um, Ryan Glover and I were getting close because he was supportive of um, some things I, were do I was doing on the radio back in the noontime days. Right. OK. Noontime um, music. Yes. Yes. And, you know, you had the Ryan Kinney uh, fashion label, which you just referenced yep. uh, with him. Um, but coming up in this game, like there wasn't a lot of technology you could lean on to build that brand awareness. And if you think about who Kenny Burns is today, and if you were to have to come up in this type of era with the tools that are available, how would you have, how would you evolve those strategies that you used back then to be relevant today? Well, I mean, you were there. Imagine if Kenny Burns had the internet or, <laughs> or social media. I mean, could you imagine the level of promotion, marketing assault that would have happened to the world? I think it's, you know, again, it's, it's, 
you know, I think my gift of people would allow me to connect in a way where, you know, and allows me to connect in a way where people have to be involved with what I'm doing. If you look at like the, the Kenny Burns show, like two days into the quarantine, I lost $225,000 in events in the next three months. And I'm like, wait, I have to figure out how to get, you know what I mean? So, and, and all I did was something I always do, but I just sat down and did it on my phone versus having direct one-on-ones or speaking to, you know, tens of thousands of people through, you know, through my hostings or speaking uh, engagements. And so, you know, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't change my approach. I think my, my ability to connect with human beings would be well received in the tech space. You know what I mean? Like the, just the blueprint of, like, I, I'm a person that I will never let the algorithm take over the feeling. I am the type of person, I will never let the robot take over the human. And I mean that wholeheartedly because I think there's a certain connection with humans. And I would just, you know, figure out the way to best do it socially and technology, technologically. Yeah, let me let me dig deeper on that because I was listening to um, an interview D-Nice did with The Breakfast Club. And he was talking about how when he's turned on, you know, uh, that first couple of nights of him spending on uh, Instagram, you know, he would get a couple thousand here, a few thousand there. And then it just one night it was just magic. And he said, but he really, I'll tell you, I'll tell you yeah. when that happened and why. Go ahead, it please. Was the human, it was the human connection he had. He got lit. I don't know. <laughs> you know, he was, he was, you know, doing what he does with his playlist. And, you know, he was talking like D nice. You hadn't heard him publicly talking like that. He was telling you, thank you. He was feeling the energy from, you know, the whatever. And it was such a vulnerable human moment that you couldn't help but like lock in. And 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 because of that, it was like, yo, we're stuck. The word travel, like, where can we go and just kind of because you know, this is like this is unheard of for our generation. We've never been stuck nowhere. Like, I mean, I've never been in the house for four months straight I, in my life. Um and so when you look at what he did, man, it was the vulnerability that connected the dots for him. Cause he was already, he was already the musical maestro. You know what I mean? Like, so it was, it was about, it was about, let me get to know you. And that's even what my wife told me. She was like, Kenny, like people see your pictures. They don't really know you. Like people that come to your seminars, people that are loyalists and want to get to know you, know you. He said, but this internet, I'm sorry, this social media gives you an opportunity to be that. I just was never the guy that wanted to be like, oh, I don't feel good and right. I'm sad. And But, you know, this this in the controlled way can do wonders for your business, for yeah. sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to come back to that point because I think that's a very salient point. Um, and he mentioned that, you know, it was 30 years leading up to that moment, right? Yeah. And so I think about when you talk about... Um, the evolved Kenny Burns in this era coming up. Um, I actually even had this conversation with Tuma Basa on a different episode. He was talking, he, he's like, you got to find a way to decommodify your presence on the internet. Right. And I would, I would ask you to go in, go in, go in on your point of um, being the guy all over social media and et cetera, because there's a lot of people trying when the quarantine first hit, everybody was live on Instagram. Everybody. So how does, how do you break through without having to go through that 30 year period like D nice or that 20, 25 year period like Kenny Burns to be able to break through these days in your mind? Yeah. I mean, you know, it's all happenstance. I don't think that there's any rhyme or reason to it. You know, you could have a rant one day. Um, you know, I don't like the way they're treating black women. This guy hit the girl in the face with the skateboard through the girl in the tram stand and you can take a stance that day. Um, that just carries you on a journey you never thought you were coming into. But that's the the mystery of social media. D Nice didn't plan that. Thirty years of working, his I mean, you know, I, I imagine this: thirty years of your life, you go back and forth on a journey. You get money. You you know, you have a nice life. You raise children, right? And then all of a sudden, it changes. It's not because it changes right then and there, and it was you know. The stars, moon, and quasars aligned in your work. What you've done all that time, the fact that you were able to get Michelle Obama, the fact that you were able to get these people, that is, you know, but there's no formula for the internet. The internet is smoke and mirrors. Like, I could probably go ham sandwich with all the 
you know, what, what do the, the, the blogs say? T that I have on people I know, but I'm not. I had real great times with these people. They might have shortcomings, but that's not on me to dish. So I think, you know, there are people that come to the social space to tell it all because they, you know, that's all they have to really offer. When you look at like how I did it in the quarantine, all I did is all I've been doing. Just like with Derek, all he did is what he's been doing. I just became, we just became more vulnerable in our offering. When you listen to me talk to her, her is 22 years old and she's been here before. But if you don't know anything about life, if you haven't lived enough life to, you know, tell her about her superpower and have her tell you about her superpower and have that mix of gumbo and festive conversation and love fest for a per person I'd never even met in my life. I knew her manager, but you would have thought I'd known her 25 years. But 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 just like Ludacris or just like Kevin Hart or just like somebody I have known and you have the same type of conversation, it's not about Kenny Burns. It's about culture. It's about framing culture. It's about regurgitating something that you haven't felt, showing you something about someone. Like Damon John, I had him on a day, and he was giving you information. I mean, this is a guy who started in hip-hop, and fashion went all the way to Shark Tank and right. got into tech and everything else. But he was, a, you know, he grew up with the Supreme Team, a notorious <laughs> gangster drug cartel. And right. like, so my thing is, like, you don't know things, you know, with me, you get an opportunity to see people in a different realm. I, I'm, I'm probably the best in our culture of framing culture and repackaging it and repurposing it back to to the people. I love that. Um, I kind of want to dig in on, you talked about, you know, showing more of yourself uh, in, in this world. And Steve Jobs had this quote says, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect them looking backwards. Um, so when you think about becoming a person to influence, what do too many of us get wrong about the strategy we may use to build that influence? Um, well, first of all, I don't know if I agree with Steve Jobs. I mean, as brilliant as he is, yeah. and I know that's that's blasphemous to say in the text space. <laughs> but you know, looking back, and I don't know Steve, never met him in my life, but you know, watching the movie, um, you know, seeing reading about him, obviously witnessing the creation of of what of what what Apple is, um, you know, the past was detrimental for him. The past was painful for him, although it might have been a driving force in ultimately, you know, um, creating his own ecosystem. Um, it was very painful. And I I actually, during COVID, got a chance to peel back some of the layers on my childhood trauma from the things I saw at a very young age and had to go through. Um, you know, I was taught to compartmentalize, put it away. Compart you know, but you had to because, you know, when you think seeing people do drugs is normal or living this type of life is normal, you become a little off. Um, so I wouldn't say go back. What I would suggest, though, is that own who you are, own what you what you saw and who your people are. Like, you know, the thing I never I never did, no matter no matter the dysfunction, I never like wrote my people off, you know, even now in culture, I don't. You could have done something to me bad in business. I'm not going to write you off. I'm going to hold you accountable, but I'm not going to write you off because what I feel is to ultimately grow and be whole as a human being, you have to accept all of your gifts as well as all of your faults. And it's not about, you know, the past. There's one thing like my wife and I, you know, I, I made sure that the disappointments in her life from men, right? I would I would not repeat those things. And she could be, she could count on me to not like, you know, be a reflection of that. You know what I mean? So we wouldn't have to live in that space because, you know, we all often hear like sometimes you go forward in life and you meet somebody like somebody and then you stuck, you know, or you or you go into business, you work with people in this space and you go in this space and you, you're dealing with the same type of people. You have to be willing to let that shit go because carrying it into each relationship ends up mirroring to me um, the, the, the possibilities of it arise. And again, all those people being the same. No, that's that's fair. That's fair. And I think what I took from that quote was you 
is only looking backwards that you can see why things made sense instead of looking out in the future yeah. and trying to make it happen. Try yeah, to but it. oftentimes a lot of people aren't that thoughtful or oh, yeah. smart. Facts, um, facts. And, 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 and we don't, it's, this is, this is not a, we're not finger pointing. We're just, you know, it's just like somebody that when, when the primaries were here in Georgia, I gave a list of pro- people to, you know, vote for because some people go and look for black last names. Some people yeah, go yeah. And, and guess or just do all Democrats when there's multiple options and you should know the best option. So, but you know, Again, tomato, tomato. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, very good, very good. Um, how do you think about monetizing um, your personal brand? So, what is the strategy people should be thinking about if they've got a thousand followers on Instagram, five thousand, twenty thousand followers? So it's not just yo, look, I got twenty thousand followers, but it actually means something. What are you doing with that twenty thousand followers? Like, what right. do you, as a marketer, how do you think about okay, let's actually make this meaningful? No question. I mean, if you have a thousand followers and those thousand followers move when you say move, it's better than having a million followers that you get a thousand followers to move. Um, And I think a lot of times, you know, we look at numbers like, you know, oh, you know, Kenny has 250,000 followers and he's it's easy. For, no, no, it's not, not, that's not necessarily the truth. Um, I have a great, you know, support system in my community that I, the ecosystem that I've created. But, you know, you should be able to move the way you move. I mean, you can look at engagement with someone with a thousand followers that gets 800 likes. I mean, that's 80 percent, you know, uh, engagement. So, you know, I I never I want people to always remember it's not about what everybody else is doing. It's about what you're doing and how well you're doing. it. You know, we all have been guilty of, um, you know, when I was coming up, it's like, you know, Puff did this by this age. I got to do this by this age. And then it got to the point where I wasn't keeping up. And then I was like, wait, but then it was nothing wrong with that because that man's journey is his journey. My journey is my journey. And I have to appreciate it. And I tell my mentees all the time, if you don't appreciate the journey, you won't appreciate what's at the end of that. And a lot of times it's not your actual dream. You know what I mean? It's not your actual you know, your end game, what you thought it was going to be. And even as you grow businesses, you're going to, you know, for me, would I have ever thought Uncle Nearest would be the biggest investment I ever made out of all the amazing things that I've done and been a part of. But to date, it's probably the best investment that I made. Now, is it over? No. But, you know, you have to be open to receive. And I think sometimes we are so, you know, it has to be this. We got to do this. And if I don't have this many followers, then, oh, man, I'm, I'm bad. No, you have to appreciate what you have and make that work for you. Back in the day, Kenny launched his own company, 2620 Music, and monopolized Atlanta's party scene in the mid-90s during the era of Freaknik. His clothing line, Ryan Kinney, which launched in 2004, garnered him the recognition of being the second black designer in Saks Fifth Avenue. Kinney also served as an executive at Rockefeller Records. Today, he's a master marketer, making deals throughout the entertainment industry, hosting the Kenny Burns Show, which streams live on IGTV, mentoring up-and-comers, and investing in companies like Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey. Very often, entrepreneurs get stuck in analysis paralysis, a time when we're working so hard to get a strategy designed that we may overlook more fundamental issues. Kenny Burns speaks on it. I think strategy is 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 a must, but without the product. I mean, you got to think about like what you're selling, right? Like if I came to you and I was like, yo, I got this whiskey and it's the best whiskey. Is that enough? You know what I'm saying? It's not enough. I have to have Uncle Nearest Premium Whiskey, the slave that taught Jack Daniels how to distill. Once I give you that, the story then becomes, oh yeah, the house on the bottle is where the orphan uh, Jack Daniels came, which is actually the Dan Call farm where Uncle Nearest was a master distiller. Oh yeah, by the way, we own that 330 acres. (laughs) Yes. Oh, yeah, by the way, uh, Jack Daniels and, and Brown Foreman thought it was uh, distillery number 16. We have uncovered, Farm Weaver's uncovered information that, that says it was distillery number seven. 
Like you gotta, you gotta, you know, I think people get so caught up in strategy as far as like, and that's the thing back to humans, right? Like if you have a product, how am I gonna move the product? When I met Fawn Weaver, I'm like, Fawn, I could do a hundred thousand cases. This is what I need to do. She's like, Kenny, wait, there's a percentage of whiskey drinkers that we have to get first before we can go ham sound. And I'm like, well, look, you, you came, you, you, you know, you, you, you partnered with the lifestyle special, right? I moved a needle. <laughs> well, no, I, I want you to move the needle. You know, the breakfast club thing you're doing, like all those things, we need all that to get pressed, da da da. But, bro, when I tell you her strategy worked, you know, but that was when strategy was necessary. Kenny, let's go after 80% of the whiskey drinkers first. Once we get them and, and it becomes about the actual liquid in the bottle, the story's gonna do what it's gonna do. But when it comes about it, then we could go and double down on, on what we are and who we are. So, I think, man, you know, strategy is necessary, man, but it's about what you're selling ultimately that will give you the energy to create a proper strategy. And you and, and listen, any business you're going into, there is a blueprint. You're going to follow the blueprint of many different people along the way. Right. So, I'm not, again, don't get don't get it mistaken like you don't have to have strategy, but I'm just giving you common sense. Any business you get into, there is a strategy that has been prepared for you. How are you going to make it yours? How are you going to effectively execute it and win? But it all goes back to the product. How important is this moment then? And, you know, with all things that are going on um, with kind of a blank slate of what the future is going to look like for our economy. Um, how is how important is this moment, the resetting of where people spend their money, where people spend their time, um, where people live, et cetera, um, for people who are trying to build an enterprise of their own? You know, I think you have to pay attention to what wasn't working pre-COVID, right? One of the things I tell my mentees all the time, customer service is a lost art. But I think customer service was also a lost art because people just didn't care about people. If you think about what COVID has done, it has brought people together. You've never seen this many white people speak out on behalf of black people. You've never seen this many, these many corporations, you know, get rid of things. I'm talking about, you know, and, and I, you've never seen this type of movement in our lifetime. This, not even civil rights movement. I mean, they did wonders, but this movement right here, they are, you know, it's moving a different, because white people are tired of those kind of white people. So long story short, I think that customer service um, being a lost art will be a huge business coming out of this. And you can see, you know, the Uber, rise of Uber, Lyft. You can see the Uber, post, I mean, Postmates. I mean, all the service businesses that have to deal with people handing you something, I think that's going to even get bigger. Um, I don't know what it is. Power to the person that does, because um, you can make a killing. And I'm sure somebody in tech is listening right now and probably has several different ideas or concepts but i think customer service um i think you know if you're going to you know uh the organic industry i don't know if you know who don c is a very good friend of mine oh yeah, yeah. um he has a brand called yeah. just don since co yes yeah, since covid well before covid he started but he's been growing vegetables and it's so interesting it's like all right you know what are we what are we doing you, you're, you're juicing that, you know what I'm saying? So I think out of this time, my point is to your question, um, out of this time, there's something that has identified with each creative that makes you feel whole and makes you feel excited about doing it. That's what you need to double down on. The customer service piece, that was a freebie for whoever. If you get really, really paid, just remember you heard it from the lifestyle specialist. There you go. Um, I saw this meme earlier and I think it was Isaac Hayes uh, that might have posted it, but somebody in that space posted it. It was, it was talking about um, longevity versus popularity. And some of the artists that were in the picture, people like Pusha T and people like T.I. who have not always been the most popular people, but they've been in the game for a long time. And I think about yeah. how how do you think about because um, even again, pre social media, you were Kenny Burns. And no question. how do you think about um, how you evolve, stay relevant, stay in the mix um, and not clout chase? Yeah. You know, people are my game. 
like my God given gift was to connect with people. And, you know, I'm interested in our culture, like, and not just interested, you know, when it's interesting. I, I love black folk. I, lo I love people, period. But my my people and, and the things I learn about our people and their contribution to the world, how we continuously take music and remix it and put it out. And I'm not literally meaning remix, but we do things sonically and melodically to music and the way that we continue to find stories that were hidden from us. And we take those stories and we amplify them and we create immovable history. You know, we, 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 you know, as a hip hop culture are quick to cancel. Uh, we're quick to erase. You know, you said, you know, I've been, I've been popping since 1992. You know what I'm saying? I graduated high school. I graduated high school in 91, got locked, well, got locked up in 90, graduated high school in 91, um, lost basketball scholarships, all opportunity in, to do something I really love, had to pivot, but went to, you know, a historically black college cluster like no other, which was the AUC, became this pro party promoter and been effectively contributing to culture since I was 20 years old. And I look at it, you know, I look 28 years almost, right? And so when you look at that, it's like, how did you stay? It was the people. I care what happens in my community. When, when it's time, you know, to speak up, I mean, Puff had posted something the other week about, you know, I wasn't gonna hold bring that up, up, but I'm happy to talk about it. Yeah, no, I mean, but but it's not a diss to him. It's just like, nah, that's not what we because I'm on the ground level. I I had at that to that point, I had Angela Rice, Seed of God, Sean King, all on my show, and I'm getting information from people who are actually on the front line. And although I don't believe in everything they believe in or practice what they practice, I respect them because they're at it every day. They're at it every day, and so when somebody comes into the pulpit for selfish reasons, you know, I call that out. But I have tenure in culture. I have a place in culture that I can do that. And nobody's going to come check me. And because I'm not even, you know, and it's not even like, what you going to do, nigga? I mean, it's not any of that. It's more about, it's more about you know who I am. You know what I'm about and you know how real I'm going to keep it. I've been that way. And I, you know, I challenge people in life, you know, not just to not walk to Brooklyn for cheesecake, but to not let anybody turn you into something you're not. Because when you got to deal with that, that's a whole nother thing. That's a whole nother thing. But that's how you stay in play. You stay in play by being you. Mm. That's it. Love that. Um, I know I remixed that a little bit, but I was flowing. That was, man. I'm like water. <laughs> Flow. Uh, when you're evaluating deals, like whether it's, you know, you're being asked to get involved as, a, as the face of something or you're making an investment in something. You said Uncle Nearest wasn't your first, but it's obviously your biggest so far. Um, what are the most important terms you're looking at that, that are meaningful for Kenny? Your father, you know, husband, 21 years. What's important for yeah, you? 21 this October. I, you know. My whole motto and credo is to mean something to somebody. I've provided experiences where people have met, gotten married, had kids, uh, realized that they, you know, wanted to do something different with their careers. I was just on the 85 South show with DC Young Fly um, and Chico Bean. And Chico Bean said to me that, graduating college he was stuck he ran into my documentary and it changed his life and that young man is, is killing the game he happens to be from dc um but the point i'm trying to make is like you got to mean something to somebody i think in life you know you know you you don't realize that it's really about what you give of you know saying like receiving is cool you know what i'm saying i always tell my mentees i put myself in money's way money has never driven me but to give people the game that changes their trajectory or changes their thought process or putting someone in position that allows them to, you know, flourish in a way that they hadn't flourished before so they could see the possibilities and what that feels like to go to those next level. Um, 
And I'm getting off topic. What was the question? Because no. I'm bringing it home. <laughs> it's like when you no. when you're evaluating opportunities. Oh, particularly so, so, deals. So, yeah. Right. And so the way that I feel about the way that I mentor um, the you know my mentees, the way that I feel about my community and how I want to mean something. I don't want, I don't want to just I want the business opportunity to mean something as well. I think we've all done things in our careers where we had to get the money. You know what I mean? Because you got to pay bills. But at the same time, as you get older and you become more successful, you can pick and choose instead of have to do. Um, and me now at this point in my life, I want to, you know, I gave the spirits brand, you know, the spirits world 15 years of my life before I ever got equity. Right. So it's much like, you know, it's, it's like what well, I deserve this right now. What other things do, do, am I passionate about? You know, my sons are both creatives in their own right. You know, I'm doing this Kenny Burns show from my office and, you know, I have, you know, these deals on the table now, but do I really want to do sign something away or do I want to go buy a building instead of using it as a, or instead of we were going to do a, my wife and I were going to do a rental property, but instead of doing that, I'm going to go buy a building. I'm going to build a production, mini production facility. It's Atlanta. I have clients like McDonald's, Coca-Cola, you know what I'm saying? Like they'll come renting it out. They end up paying. So my thing is like, when I look at things, I'm looking at them more purposefully. I want to have, you know, the legacy piece attached to everything I do. Obviously everything I look at now has to involve some type of equity. And then, you know, like I said, I want all of that at the end of the day to mean something to somebody, specifically my community and my family. When you look back at how you vetted deals, you talked about this, you know, everybody's got to pay the bills, right? Um, and I would imagine you did some things, I'm making an assumption here, which I shouldn't do, but I'm imagining you probably did some things earlier that were less authentic because you were trying to figure the it out. The only thing I ever done, the only thing I've ever done that I actually was uncomfortable doing because, you know, I pride myself in doing business with companies that I actually participated in. Whether I created the Heineken Red Star Soul Tour, I drank Heineken like a motherfucker. Um, you know, Grey Goose, Moet Hennessy, um, anything I've ever been a part of, I've always, you know, used the product and really supported the product or and or brand. The one thing that I took fifty thousand, no, it was like one hundred twenty-two thousand, was from Cool Cigarettes. I will never, ever support anything tobacco other than Cuban cigars, if I can manage to make my, I love Cuban cigars, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that again. Um, so you don't have to do things you don't want to do. Um, again, that was something that I know people that smoke. I kind of, you know what I'm saying? Like use that as kind of the reasoning and it helped, you know, like for my 35th birthday part of the Versace mansion, I needed some of that coin to offset some of the costs. Right. Um, but I wouldn't do that again because I just don't believe I don't believe in cigarettes. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So how, how do you advise people who feel like they're 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 the young Kenny Burns of today and they're trying to get to that next step? And there's this opportunity that will give me a small bag or a small billboard with my face on it or et cetera. How does that hurt yeah, just them? Don't, just don't just don't do cigarette brands. <laughs> yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is my thing. If you drink, if you smoke, you know, that's one thing. Like, you know, I drink. So. You know, I wanted to be educated on the finest, you know, the finest drinks. I mean, I I probably will stop drinking, honestly. And when I do, I mean, my shares and my investment will be there, but I wouldn't any longer be, you know, saying I drink. And then that would. But my point is, find something you're, you're attached to authentically, whatever you, you know, you like, get involved with. You don't have to do things you don't want to do. I, and I always tell my sons that, you know, it's like my mom the other day said, my sons need to suffer. I'm like, suffer? That's such a deep statement. And it wasn't like suffer, like they need to go just, you know, whatever. It was more like you give them everything. I said, well, no, I, I support their dreams. My oldest son, who's now going to Kennesaw State University play, to play Division One basketball, that has been his dream since the seventh grade. I have given him the opportunity to work his ass off. Now, mind you, yeah, he went to Sierra Canyon and played with Marvin Bagley. Yeah, he went to Wheeler and played, you know what I'm saying, with EJ. And, but my point is, he wanted to play. I was blessed enough to put him in positions to earn what he wanted to earn. That doesn't make him, you know, just because he he's not scrubbing floors and walking 40 miles or whatever. You know, my thing is, like, work ethic 
is what you want to instill. You know what I'm saying? In in your children, in your employees, and in your partners. How hard are they willing to work? If you want something bad enough, you're going to work to get it. And working to get it doesn't mean sacrificing your soul or putting yourself in a compromising situation. You know what I'm saying? There's been plenty of times in the music business, there was a door that I just didn't go into because, you know, it's the music business. You never know <laughs> what's going on behind door number eight. And, yeah. and so, you know, my point is that you don't have to do things you don't want to do. You should never feel like there's, you know, pressure to go do something that just makes you uncomfortable to, to, to gain. You know, again, authentically being yourself, you'll get there. If you're yourself long enough, they will pay you to be. Yeah. Um, I want to leave this here because you have um, your cause, you know, the dream is real. Right. And um, I'll, I'll define that for me. And then I'm going to ask you to spin how you think about it. For, so for me, it is, you know, those visions that you have for yourself. You talked about it, you know, get, you view yourself long enough. They'll pay you to be you. So that that dream that you have, that personality that you have, that thing that makes you uniquely you. If you lean into that the things that you dream for yourself are actually possible for you if you are true and authentic to yourself. So that's what it means to me when I hear you say that. Um, what is it that you intend when you say that? Uh, I mean, really what you said. I love saying it too. The dream <laughs> is real. Um, but yeah, I, um, I, I just, I didn't want to live in despair. I didn't want to live in my circumstances I didn't want to be the person that, you know, my father is 70 something years old and been in Washington DC his whole life. I just didn't want to be that, you know what I mean? I didn't really have a real relationship with him, but I didn't want to be, you know, when I got locked up, God rest the dead, my grandmother actually, it'd be a, a year since her passing um, on the 4th, on July 4th. And you know, i never forget, she's like, baby, you know, you can still go work for UPS or FedEx <laughs> and, and and get you a pension in 30 years. And I'm like, Grandma, you think I was selling dope to, <laughs> to, to, to wait 30 years to get what I was getting? And I just I just always had a drive, man. And I know I get it from my mother because she lived life for a living, you know, on very little. Um, I never felt poor. Um, music was always playing, you know, non chompa incense. Like I just, I never felt out of whack. And I, I I believed and still believe that the dream is real and what you want from it. You know, I wanted to be married at 16, I feel like, cause I just didn't know what family was. So I, I never, I never treated women bad. You know what I'm saying? Everybody felt like, you know, that, you know, they got there, you know, whatever. And, and I feel like that's always been my thing. Be intentful. I tell my sons, when you walk on that court, have intent, go out there and, get what you came for and that's what i try to i try to live by and that's the dream is real to me i think you know living with intent knowing that it's possible and and and, and getting what you came for Tech Green Money is a production of Blavity Afrotech. It is produced by Morgan DeBond and me, Will Lucas. With additional production support by Love Beach, Stephanie Ogbogu, and Raven Nearborn. Special thank you to Micah Davis, Sakara Savanyan, you know, like the wine, and yes, that's his real name. Learn more about Kenny Burns and other tech disruptors and innovators at Afrotech.com. Go get your money. Peace and love. Ooh.